Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, bonjour, bon après-midi, and welcome to our latest Meet of the Winemaker seminar and back by popular demand for his second time around. Welcome, Mr. Laurent Meret. Laurent, how are you? Hello, very well, thank you. Very happy to be uh, with you and uh, this afternoon and uh, with United States. I'm uh, very happy and uh, we're going to make a uh, great uh, testing. <laughs> Fantastic, great, great to see you. So just again for everybody looking in, um, please feel free to ask questions in the uh, Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll be happy to answer those either as we go along or at the end. And of course, if we don't get time to answer all the questions, we will be happy to answer anything you might need to know by email. So anyway, we want to keep the formalities fairly short today because we've got so much interesting uh, content to talk about with Laurent on these wines. Um, so perhaps just before we start, Laurent, would you like to tell people who haven't seen you before a little bit about yourself and your career as a winemaker? Yeah, of course. So uh, I am the winemaker of Boucharine, uh, Ifis, and uh, it was uh, 23 years that I am the winemaker. So it began uh, a long history. <laughs> uh, and... Um, I was born in uh, Dijon, and uh, I study uh, analogy uh, to the University of uh, Burgundy. And uh, after I start to, to work uh, on the wine, of course, uh, and uh, I start to win high in uh, Boucharine Ephis, and I am again in Boucharine uh, Ephis. Uh, actually, you are in my house. Uh, I live. Uh, uh, between uh, Bone and uh, chalon sur saône near the river Saône, uh, because I like fishing. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, my other passion, <laughs> wine and fishing, <laughs> my two passions. And uh, you are uh, to my office, and uh, is uh, uh, 20, 20 hours. Uh, in France. Actually, we have uh, very good uh, weather. The temperature is uh, 32, 33 degrees uh, Celsius. So it's uh, perfect uh, for uh, the wine. <laughs> Great. We'll talk, we'll talk about that a little later about the vintage because this is uh, very exciting this year. But so just to say, you are a, a Burgundian, a true Burgundian. Yeah. What, yeah. Does, what does Burgundy mean to you personally, Laurent? When you when you, somebody asks who's never been to Burgundy and from yourself, what does Burgundy mean to you? Uh, my, my father, my grandfather, my uh, own grand grandfather, uh, all people was uh, in Dijon, born in, in Dijon and in, uh, in Beaune. And uh, my family is uh, in Burgundy, uh, my wife is Burgundy. Uh, so I am a true uh, Burgundy and uh, uh, of course, uh, I, I love to vinify in, uh, in Bourgogne. It's uh, very important for me. Uh, uh, vive la Bourgogne! <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, yes, we'll talk more in detail about your wines just in a few minutes. Um, I'm just going to take one or two minutes to explain to people looking in a very brief history of the uh, Bouchard family because they are one of the oldest um, established wine merchants in the famous town of Bone. Uh, as many of you know, winemaking um, has been going on in Burgundy since the second century AD, since Roman times. And probably on a you know, modern day Burgundy, as we like to refer, it goes back to the Cistercian monks. It's not that old because it only goes back to the 12th century when they got serious about it. Um, uh, and what I would say, modern day merchant wine trading really started um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the 19th century. And the Bouchard family uh, were actually cloth makers uh, from a little further south, uh, just to the east of Lyon, which was the textile capital of France back in the day. And uh, they would uh, run their carts up with their cloth uh, to Paris and to Brussels. Um, and basically one day's carriage ride uh, from Lyon on your way up to Paris or Brussels or wherever you were going to sell your cloth put you in bone overnight. And that's where the Bouchards met winemakers and obviously fraternized with them. 
uh, and then they would buy barrels of wine and throw them on their cart with the cloth and sell it when they got to their destination. So a négociant, as we term them today, was exactly that, a wine trader, somebody who bought and sold uh, wines. As we'll talk a little bit later, it's more complicated than that today. Um, but that was really the start of the modern day merchant wine trading. In 1750, Joseph uh, Bouchard, the founder, founded uh, his company in Bone. You know, he obviously thought that winemaking was more interesting and lucrative than selling cloth. So he brought his uh, family and settled in Bone and started the family winery, which was called Bouchard Père and Fils. So I'm sure you may be familiar with that. Um, and then the third generation son of that family, uh, Bouchard Aîné, Aîné in French means eldest son, and for reasons unknown, he decided to disagree with his father and split off and set up his own company in competition with, uh, with his father. And so Bouchard en Enfis means the eldest son and his son. And since that day, uh, there were, have been two very famous wine houses in Bone called Bouchard. Now, actually, in Burgundy in general, Bouchard is a very well-known name, a bit like Smith in England law, I think. A lot of Bouchards. We'll, we'll talk about one later. Uh, and today, uh, Bouchard and Fils is one of the uh, world's most successful and most uh, well-known uh, Burgundy negotiants today. Um, one last thing, if any of you are looking in, and when all this horrible COVID stuff is over, and I'm sure it will be, we would love to welcome you to the uh, Bouchard headquarters and tasting room which is the Hôtel de Conseil du Roi. As you can see, this is the, the King's Councillor's House, the first solid standing structure outside the city walls of Bone. And that's where we have our cellars and our visitor centers, center called the, the Parcours des Cinq Sens, which is the Five Senses Tasting Tour. Not too much time to talk about today, but it's a great interactive tasting tour. And as you wind your way through the cellars and taste wine, you can learn out about how all of your five senses are engaged when you're tasting wine, obviously from the aromas, the colors, the flavors, and even the sounds of chinking glasses, rustling leaves, and chirping birds. There we are. So all of that waiting for you in the beautiful town of Bone uh, uh, as soon as you can get on a plane out of the United States and they'll let you in, which will be soon, I'm sure. All right, so let's move on. and. Um, before we start um, tasting the wines, Laurent, very quickly, we spoke to you about six weeks ago, uh, and now we're two weeks away from harvest. What has changed between the last time we spoke to you and today, and how is the 2020 vintage shaping up for us? I think uh, we have a very, actually, an exceptional vintage. Uh, I never see that. It was uh, 30 years that I've been inside. I never see that. It's perfect. Uh, we are very, we have rain uh, at a good time. And uh, there was uh, six uh, weeks that uh, we speak. Uh, and uh, I said, uh, if we have lots of, uh, just a lot uh, of rain, it, it's going to be perfect. And the last week we have changed, we have just a rain, no storm, but a little rain, and it was perfect. The temperatures uh, are very good, mm, to about 30 degrees Celsius, so it's perfect. And uh, I think we can keep a good acidity uh, on the wine, and to particular to the white wine. And I think it's going to be a very great uh, vintage in white wine, uh, I hope that uh, we make uh, the vintage of the century <laughs> on the white wine. So it's perfect. We we think that we're going to start the harvest uh, at the end of August, uh, about uh, 24th uh, August. Uh, we start with uh, Maconnais and Cochalones and uh, in First of September, uh, we start uh, with uh, Côte de Bonne and after uh, Côte de Nuit. Perfect, uh, great. It's interesting, uh, if we compare with uh, 2018, uh, it's funny because for me, it's uh, the same vintage, 
the same date of uh, record, but with more rapidity. If I want to summer uh, to resume to summer uh, the, this vintage. Great. So we all know that every year is the vintage of the century in Burgundy. Yeah. No, yeah, we know yeah, that. Every year. <laughs> <laughs> it's but, true. It's but it's true, true in, in 2020. So I know we're here specifically to talk about the 2018 vintage that we're pre-selling, or we'll do that. But anybody looking in, make a note in your diary that uh, in two years' time we'll be having the same conversation, hopefully not on, on Zoom. Uh, and uh, you need to be uh, thinking ahead to, to, to put your names on the list for these fantastic 2020s that are going to be coming out. All right, so one last thing to discuss before we dive into the nitty gritty of the wine tasting law. Last time we were here, we talked more about the, the Côte Chalonnage, a little bit more about the generic Burgundy wines. And here we're going to the very heart of Burgundy, which we call the Côte d'Or, which is the Côte de Nuit and Côte de Beaune. Could you just give us a very quick overview of those two regions and what, what we should expect from each and what the differences are? Uh, for me, uh, so, sorry for my English, but uh, Neil, uh, I, I speak English like, uh, like a Spanish school. But uh, <laughs> Neil help me uh, and translate if I have a problem. Uh, so for me, uh, Côte de Nuit is uh, the terroir uh, for the red wine. Uh, we have a lot of Grand Cru uh, in the Côte de Nuit. We have a lot of clay and uh, we have an exposition on East. Uh, in Côte de Beaune, it's more uh, south uh, east, and uh, we are more south, and uh, it's 50-50 uh, uh, red wine and white wine. But in Côte de Beaune, it's a terroir for the great uh, white wine, uh, like uh, Batard Morachet, Morachet, and uh, we're going to have, uh, after, uh, to, for the tasting, uh, Chassin Premier Cru, and uh, I explain you uh, why it's a great wine and uh, why uh, the soil is a responsibility of uh, uh, this wine. <laughs> so for also... me, Côte de Nuit for red wine, great red wine, and Côte de Bon uh, more for white wine, if, if we count uh, summer. So generally, as you say, um, you know, most of the, the Grand Cru's, in fact, all of the Grand Cru's red except one comes from the, the Côte de Nuit and very little wine in the Côte de Nuit. More of an even split red and white on the Côte de Beaune. Stylistically, is there generally a difference between reds from the Côte de Nuit and reds from the Côte de Beaune? Yeah. Generally, uh, in Côte de Nuit, uh, it's more uh, dark fruit and uh, with uh, tana, uh, with more tana. In Côte de Beaune, uh, it's more soft tana and uh, more um, uh, red crude. Red crude. Uh, it's a difference on, on, the, on the red. Uh, on the white wine, uh, it's more easy uh, because uh, all the great white wine are in uh, Côte de Beaune. And uh, the difference, for, ex for example, between a Marsanet Blanc uh, in Côte de Nuit and uh, a Meursault, uh, it's easy. Uh, you have more fruit, it's more round, more grass, uh, more long, uh, long phenol, uh, etc. Uh, you have less minerality uh, than, uh, for example, the Marsanet. In Marsanet, you have more acidity, uh, but you have not a long phenol. Uh, it's, it's completely different. And so we talk a lot about terroir in Burgundy, of course, which is the different styles of limestone and clay. Can you briefly yeah. explain to us um, which, which soils are most suited for white wine and which soils are most suited for red wine and how that works? Uh, for the white wines, uh, uh, we have... Um, when, when my grandfather, uh, who makes wine, uh, he said always it's very easy in Burgundy. When the soil is white, you plant Chardonnay, when the soil is red, you plant Pinot Noir. <laughs> and if you go uh, to Burgundy, it's very easy to see that. Uh, when the soil is red, you have Pinot. When the soil is uh, white, uh, with the sock, uh, with the rock, uh, you, you plant uh, Chardonnay. And that's because these high chalky calcus soils are so much better for producing the acidity and the minerality and the freshness. Yeah, freshness, 
acidity, freshness, uh, minerality, uh, citrus aroma, uh, it's a soy. Oh, cool. Right, so how about we, uh, we get right in there and start looking at some of the wines because I think as this conversation goes on, uh, we have a lot, much, a lot more about Burgundy from actually discussing the individual wine. So take us to Bone and the Marconnet. Uh, yeah. What can you tell us about this wine, Laurent? Okay, uh, Bone Premier Cru de Marconnet is uh, a wine funny for me because uh, the parcel, you have the both color. Fifty uh, percent uh, of this parcel is with Chardonnay and fifty percent with uh, Pinot Noir. So uh, we make in Boucharine this the both color. Uh, this afternoon we have in a white wine, and uh, white wine uh, represents about. Uh, 20% of uh, the appellation of Bon Premier Cru and 80% uh, in uh, red wine. So uh, the particularity of this appellation is that the proper property, uh, the owner, um, decide to, to plant in 50% uh, in white and 50% in red because he likes, he likes to drink uh, white wine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was uh, about uh, I make this wine since uh, 2000, 2000 uh, so it was uh, more 20 years that I identify uh, this, this, this wine and uh, the plants are uh, not very old but, but uh, 40, 40 years, the wine is uh, 40 years uh, old. So, now, now Laurent, uh, just, a, just a question Laurent. Yes. So, we were explaining about you know soil types and and sometimes in Burgundy in the same parcel you might have a a, a very steep slope and you, you might have very different soil types in the same parcel but here you told me earlier that all the soil is pretty much the same in the Marconnet. Yeah. So this is Chardonnay that's really planted on soils that could usually be used for making red wine. Okay. How does that affects the style of the white wine. Yeah, uh, ch uh, ch when we plant Chardonnay with uh, soy for uh, Pinot Noir, uh, we have uh, a wine very different. It's very different uh, uh, than a Meursault or a Chassagne or a Puligny. Um, this wine has the particularity to have uh, uh, a pH, not uh, uh, a great pH, uh, to about uh, 3.5 to 6. Uh, so, uh, is very open very quickly and uh, you can taste very quickly after the bottle here yeah, uh, it's a vintage 2018 is perfect actually in apparity and uh, in two years three years is going to be perfect uh, with a fish for example because it is open very quickly and it's a particularity when you plant Chardonnay on the soil for uh, Pinot Noir, you have this particularity that you have uh, uh, open, the wine open very uh, quickly. More quickly, more quickly than a Merceau, for example. Okay, and, we'll, talk uh, in, we'll talk in yeah. two seconds about how you make the wine. I would just like to go back to the map and, you know, I think we yeah. talked in our last Burgundy presentation about the names of the single vineyards, yeah. Arconet. Yeah. And sometimes we know why, and sometimes we don't know why, and sometimes there are differences of opinion. So tell me, uh, tell me about <laughs> Marconnet, uh, Laurent. Les Marconnet, uh, les, les Marconnet, we have uh, two theories. <laughs> the first theory is uh, it was uh, in uh, there was about uh, 10, 10 century. Uh, Barbar, I don't know if it's a uh, tribu barbar. Barbarians. Barbarians. Barbarians come in the Burgundy, by the north of Burgundy. And uh, the first, uh, they, they come in Bone, and the name of the barbarian was Les Marconnan. So Marconnan, Marconnet. It's the okay. first theory. The second theory is that uh, uh, you have. Uh, um, water on the soil, and uh, we we name that uh, Marconneau, 
and uh, Marconov, Marconov. Yeah. So it's a second theory. I don't know uh, the true theory. Uh, we have the both. So uh, I have my theory, Neil has, has his theory. <laughs> And uh, we don't know uh, what is true. <laughs> I, I prefer your theory, actually. Look, I like okay. marauding barbarians going through uh, and drinking yeah. wine and <laughs> make, making trouble. That sounds, that sounds like more fun than, uh, than marshy land. There we go. Uh, more blood. <laughs> like blood. <laughs> tell us, tell us about, about how you made the wine. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the wine the grape arrived to the winery um, in Kessin with the harvest is uh, with hand and uh, I just came to 100 percent and I put directly in the pneumatic press and I press uh, during the two hours. Uh, after I put the must uh, in the stainless steel tank and um, the alcoholic fermentation of course starts. I like to vinify to about uh, 14 degrees Celsius, not more, mm -hmm. because if we want to keep uh, freshness, uh, to keep a fresh aroma, it's necessary to vinify uh, in cold temperature. Uh, and when you have about uh, 20 grams per liter of sugar, uh, I put the must in barrel. And uh, the fermentation alcoholic, alcoholic uh, the alcoholic fermentation uh, finish in barrel. Uh, I use 30% uh, of new oak uh, in this cuvee, and uh, uh, the aging is uh, 12 months. Now, you say that the, the bone wine is naturally quite rich and fat. So does that affect how you do batonnage? Are you doing batonnage on this wine or, or not? Yes. Uh, just a little batonnage uh, during uh, uh, October, November, December, three months. During three months, one time uh, per week. And only uh, five minutes per barrel. And I baton the lid uh, because I want uh, a rich wine uh, with uh, roundness in mouth. So it's necessary, yes. Yeah. Okay, so why don't you uh, give us a virtual tasting and yeah. tell us this uh, Bon Premier Cru Marconnet is tasting. Santé. Oh, thank santé. you. I'm sorry, I'm drinking water. Oh, yeah. uh, water. Chichin. <laughs> Actually, this one. It's very open. It, it's incredible uh, to taste the white wine, uh, which is very, very open uh, so quickly. And um, we have a toasting nut, actually. Uh, and uh, uh, we have peach, peach and toasting nut. Uh, it's, uh, it's funny. It's perfect in aperitif. Actually, it's too young for me for uh, for uh, fish with cream or uh, I prefer in aperitif actually in two years it's going to be open uh, perfectly but actually it's very uh, perfect for aperitif. Do you think generally that the 2018 whites will drink quite young? Uh, more I am old more I prefer to taste uh, young the white wine. <laughs> there's, uh, no time, there's no time to wait. <laughs> exception, uh, yeah, because I like to, to have in aperitif uh, a white wine of Burgundy. Uh, exception with uh, Puligny and Meursault Chassagne, uh, uh, because I like uh, when they have uh, 15 years. But uh, <laughs> Bon premier cru for me, bon premier cru Marconnet for me, you can keep uh, eight, eight years, eight, ten years. Uh, I don't know if we can, you can keep more, we're going to see perhaps. But uh, I said, uh, I said uh, you have not a lot of acidity in uh, 2018. Uh, so it could be dangerous to keep more than ten years for me. And uh, right. I prefer to... Uh, to, to tell you uh, 
test uh, in five years, uh, actually, and in, during five years. I prefer to say that. So speaking of uh, Chassagne, let's go on to the second wine and look at the yes, second wine. Donc, Premier Cru. We are again in uh, Côte de Beaune. We are in uh, Chassagne Montrachet, and it's a Premier Cru, but you have not the name of the single vineyard. It's normal because I blend uh, three single vineyards, uh, Lechenvot. We're going to, to have the, the map. Lechenvot, Les Macherelles, and uh, Les Vergers. And you can see, it's very uh, interesting to see that you have uh, the three single vineyards. It's just a bit just near Le Mont Rachet and Batar Mont Rachet. And uh, you have only only 20 meters between Les Chenvot and Le Mont Rachet with the famous Grand Cru of uh, Chassagne, a very expensive uh, wine, and you have only uh, 20 meters. So uh, why we blend the, the, this three single vineyard? The reason is that we have only one or two barrels per year. So for make a big cuvée, uh, and each single vineyard uh, give something to the wine. So uh, Les Vergers, it's more uh, uh, plus pentu. It's, it's more sloped. It's more, more sloped. Mm. And uh, the, more, the exposition uh, is east. Les Macherelles, is, uh, the exposition is south. And Les Chenvot, it's east. So when we blend, we have a, dif a different aroma with uh, each parcel, each single vineyard. And uh, the vinification is uh, the same thing that uh, for the bone. The difference is uh, that you have more uh, new oak, uh, 40%, and uh, you have uh, batonnage during uh, uh, five uh, months. So now, there's sometimes a perception, uh, Laurent, that a single vineyard is better than several vineyards, but that is not necessarily so, right? It can be just as good, no. and if it comes from three different parcels than one specific parcel. No, it's not necessary. Uh, sometimes when you blend a different single vineyard, uh, you can have uh, a better wine than uh, with uh, just one single vineyard, because each, for me, each single vineyard uh, as is a proper uh, identity. And so when you blend different uh, single vineyards, you blend different aroma. It's mathematic. <laughs> <laughs> now, in terms of the uh, vinification, uh, similarities and differences between the bone, is it pretty much the same system? Uh, yeah, it's the same vinification uh, that uh, the bone at pneumatic press uh, and uh, cool, cool uh, temperature for the alcoholic fermentation. Uh, uh, the difference is on the new oak. And uh, I have another difference, but it's, it's technique. Uh, I use uh, more toasting barrels, toasting not barrels. Uh, because uh, in Chassagne, I have a barrel with, uh, uh, when they make the barrel, uh, they burn uh, to about uh, one hour, and uh, for the bone premier cru, it's only uh, 40 minutes. So uh, we have a difference uh, of aroma for the barrel. Uh, we have more uh, toasting nut. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, pandy peas. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Pandy peas is, is spiced spiced honey bread. That's quite oh, a spicy. term. Yes. But uh, yes, that, that's vin vanilla spice, nutty nuttiness and toastiness coming from that extra toast uh, on the barrel. Stylistically, this is obviously white wine made on some of probably the best white wine soil in the world. So very different from the bone in profile and tasting. 
uh, when to see that is more close to the nose is more close than the bone uh, you have more uh, white fruit with alcohol white okay. fruit uh, like the mirabelle uh, yeah. Mir mirabelle uh, the yellow plums that grow in burgundy yeah pear uh, You have a very good balance. It's uh, typically of uh, using Stratan, Premier Cru. You have a very good balance with a tofting nut uh, to the phenol. And uh, you have a uh, peach beer. Uh, uh, it's elegant. Uh, and you can keep more long time than the bone. Uh, of course, uh, for me, is uh, too young. Uh, you you take your bottle, you you put in your cellar, and you don't touch uh, uh, before uh, two or three years. <laughs> and I am sure that you can keep uh, more long time because you have more acidity than the bone. And uh, it's typically it's a very very clear. Uh, you have more acidity, and you. For me, uh, you can keep uh, 15 years, uh, no problem, no problem. Fantastic. Uh, uh, do you have a favorite between the two for today? In aperitif, I prefer the bone. Hmm. I prefer the bone in aperitif, uh, but if, if I uh, have a fish, this, this, uh, if Madame Meret uh, are cooking a fish after, uh, I prefer uh, the chassagne. <laughs> And, and I will ask you the same question in another five years and probably get a different answer. So, so people, uh, if, if you're looking in and wish to know, um, obviously we're in White Burgundy, which are some of the most prized, collectible um, and wonderful Chardonnays in the world and prized accordingly. Um, Bonne Premier Cru Marconnet, however, all things considered relatively for Premier Cru Burgundy is relatively inexpensive and this bottle will cost you around $90 retail. And the Chassin Marche Premier Cru, as you can see, um, because it is on some of the um, best soils in the world for Chardonnay, very close to the Grand Cru, and producing tiny quantities, um, that would run you $115. I didn't ask Laurent, how many barrels of the Chassin Marche do we make, Premier Cru? Uh, in uh, 2018, uh, seven barrels. Seven barrels. There we are. So that, uh, that's about... Uh, that's more 2,000 bottles. Yeah, less than little, little more, 2,000 bottles. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so there not, it's a Burgundy. It's a Burgundy. Very hey. small production, very small production. Do, do you know, Laurent, I have this conversation uh, a, a lot of the time now. You know, um, the, words, the words burgundy and value for money shouldn't be used in the same sentence because it's not at all the concept you drink burgundy and especially white burgundy because it's so freaking awesome and brilliant uh, and and so collective and so lovely but anyway i'm going to contradict myself because we're going to go north now to fissa where actually yeah. value for money really does have a meaning so let's get on our bike pedal for a few minutes up the road to fissa and you can tell us all about uh yeah. As yeah, no. So we go now to the Côte de Nuit, uh, Fissa. Uh, it's uh, on the north of uh, Côte de Nuit. And the single vineyard uh, La Masière, it's not a premier cru, but it's a single vineyard La Masière. It's uh, on the center of uh, Fissa, of the Appalachian Fissa. Uh, very in the center. And uh, La Masière, uh, the name come. Uh, in Burgundy, we said uh, une masure. And une masure, a masure, uh, it's a very old uh, house uh, who was uh, destroyed by, by the war, for example. And uh, masure become masière. So uh, it's a reference to masure, very old uh, house. Um, it's a very for me, an iconic wine. It's an iconic wine for me because it was 100 years that uh, this appellation is on the range of uh, Boucharine and Fils. 
So it's a very long uh, history with uh, Bouchard and Afis. And um, when so just, the, just, to, just, to just to clarify that, Laurent, what, what you're saying is that Bouchard has been buying, because we buy the fruit from a, from a family here, right? And Bouchard, as a winery, has been buying that same fruit from the same family for over yeah. 100 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a family of uh, avocats uh, in Paris. Lawyers, uh, yeah, a family uh, of lawyers. Huh? And it was uh, 100 years that uh, sells uh, this parcel to Bouchard and Afis. So, uh, so for me, it's my baby. <laughs> it's my baby. <laughs> It's Anna Madière. <laughs> yeah, so I'm and, asking me how many years did you say? Uh, so over a hundred years, Carla, for yeah. what? So um, Laurent hasn't yeah. been in the wine for a hundred years, but uh, <laughs> only for 30. <laughs> uh, another particularity on this wine is that uh, the, the vine is very old. Uh, the vineyard has uh, 70 years old. Uh, so it, it's uh, it's old, and uh, the problem it's not a problem for me because uh, it, it's good for the quality, but it's a problem for Neil for sell lot of bottle because uh, we we have only 20 hectoliters per hectare on this parcel. So uh, uh, for example, normally uh, uh, I can make uh, 40 hectoliters, the double. 40 hectoliters per hectare. So I make only 20 hectoliters per hectare in 2018, which was a very good vintage for the quality and the quantity. Uh, in 2019, for example, I make only 15 hectoliters per hectare. So uh, it's very old, but it's concentrated. It's a wine very concentrated. We can, we can never get enough. Fissin Le yeah. I can tell you we can it's never. True. Can we talk a little bit about uh, the position? Because I affectionately call Fissin poor man's Gevry Chambertin. You know, you um, tell me a little about the, the relationship between Gevry and Fissin. Right. Uh, some, Sometimes we said uh, Fissin is uh, the wine for the, the power of uh, Gevry Chambertin, but it's not true. Uh, for me, Fissa is a, is a great appellation, uh, and uh, it, it's true, it, it's such Gevray Chambertin, but uh, for me, it's different. Uh, Fissa, you have more acidity, and uh, La Mazière is more rich, very rich, uh, with a lot of tannin. Uh, it's a wine with a lot of tannin uh, that you can keep long time. Uh, a lot of tanna, but soft tanna, warm tanna. It's, uh, it's very funny because each year it's the same thing. Uh, we have a lot of tanna, warm tanna, and uh, a great color, uh, a very fabulous color. And uh, I like Fisana Mazier uh, for, for that. Can you tell me a little bit about the oak regime? Uh, yeah. The uh, uh, just a, a word of the vinification uh, of this if, wine. If you like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so for the red wine, um, I distinct 100% or 50% uh, percent. It depends the appellation. In Fils à la matière, I distinct 100%. Uh, this time. This time. Yeah. This time in 100%. And uh, uh, I don't crush, and I put directly uh, the grape on the on the vat, good vat. I vinify in good vat, and um, I make a cold maceration uh, to 15 degrees Celsius during the five days, and I, after five days, uh, the alcoholic fermentation starts, and. Uh, uh, during about, uh, if I remember, 22, 23 days of alcoholic fermentation. Uh, I push two times per day uh, uh, the hat of uh, yeah. the, the, cap the vat. Punch down, yeah. Yeah. And uh, after, uh, I blend the pressed juice in the juice. And uh, after one week in tank, I put in barrel 20% of new oak because I don't want 
I want to keep the fruit and uh, I don't want to aroma with uh, not more toxin not uh, on this wine. And uh, 12 months in barrel, 20% uh, of pure. And uh, of course, malolactic fermentation is uh, finished. And uh, after I put in, uh, of course, uh, the wine. <laughs> Now, oh. how is it tasting? I have to tell you, Laurent, I, uh, I know my friend Brian uh, Bakari from uh, yeah. uh, Louisiana is watching in, and I, I tasted this wine with him about two weeks ago, and it was just absolutely full of fruit and lush, uh, delicious, very open uh, for such a young uh, for your shop. Mm -hmm. find it obviously, big tannin, so it has great potential. 18, then a, a great year for reds? 18 is, is a great uh, vintage for uh, red wine, yes. Uh, great vintage, but uh, I think in uh, Côte de Nuit, you can keep long time. Uh, in Côte de Beaune, not, not long, long, long time. Uh, Pisana Masia, you can keep uh, 15 years, uh, no problem. Because you have uh, acidity, uh, it's very important. It's okay. You, you want to keep your wine in good condition and uh, you have a good concentration, very important. You have a lot of tannin in this wine. If you have acidity and a lot of tannin, you can keep long time and 2018 is a very good vintage in red wine. If you have wine uh, uh, like Jevray <laughs> <laughs> at the uh, village, just a village, uh, you, you have uh, less acidity and uh, it could be a problem for keep long time. So how's it tasting today? Yeah. So you have to the nose uh, Kirschnot. You have Kirschnot, uh, very Surprise, I'm very surprised. Uh, he's open, uh, he's grass, and you have uh, firm, the large. legs. Yes, legs. we call them tears in French, but legs in English, yes. Les jambes. You have a lot yes. of legs uh, on the glass, and uh, uh, it's very rich in alcohol. Uh, you, you are to about uh, more 14 degrees Celsius. So, uh, oh. uh, yes, it's a uh, you have alcohol and you have Kirschnot because you have a, a lot of alcohol. So and, just, somebody, uh, just somebody asked me to explain Kirschnot is, is uh, long as saying Kirsch aromas, Kirsch notes. So Kirsch, of course, is that, uh, uh, that sort of uh, cherry. cherry brandy uh, mm. uh, aromas, the intense cherry notes and a little bit of, little bit of higher alcohol coming through there. Mm. Yeah, you, you have cherry, cherry is not, cherry is not on the mouth. And uh, with uh, blueberry, blueberry uh, nut, and uh, very elegant. And uh, it's a wine very concentrated uh, with a lot of tannin, but soft tannin, it's not aggressive, not an aggressive wine. And uh, I think it's perfect now with uh, red meat, uh, beef, with red beef, uh, bigger steak. And uh, <laughs> I love that in Texas, Carla. <laughs> <laughs> so wonderful. Laurent, I have to tell you, we taste this wine year in, year out. It's always fabulous. It's yeah. always one of your, probably always your best wine. And I can yeah. tell you 2018 is stunning. And as I did say, I would contradict myself because, you know, I said Burgundy and value for money is not what you use in the same sentence. This is absolutely the, uh, the proof that that is wrong. It's a wine that retails somewhere around $45, uh, and that gives you so much pleasure and so much value. Wonderful, wonderful wine. Congratulations, Laura. That's, that's terrific. Very good. He has a very good value. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Uh, All right. Well, let's uh, have a quick gamble down south then. We'll go to the Côte de Bonne and to the famous village of Pomar. Pomar. Pomar, premier cru des Charmeaux. So, les Charmeaux, it's... Uh, Charm, les charmes, uh, so it's uh, the tree, uh, it's uh, a little tree, and uh, les charmes, les charmeaux. Uh, it's a very small appellation, 
very, very small apparition. Uh, I think in the premier crew of Poma, it's uh, uh, la plus petite appellation en premier cru. Uh, oh, so it's the smallest premier crew parcel. Yeah, smallest premier crew parcel. Uh, the exposition is uh, east, and uh, uh, you have uh, uh, the vineyard is a plant uh, with a uh, uh, grand pente. Uh, very steep slope, yeah. Very steep slope. Uh, and for um, Marley Charmeau, the particularity is uh, you know, you you are uh, not uh, on the side of uh, Volney, you are on the side of Bone. And uh, for me, you have the elegance of the Bone, uh, finesse, uh, and uh, tannin, but soft tannin. And uh, it's very different that, for example, les Rugiens, from our premier cru les Rugiens, uh, which you are more rustic tannin. Uh, Les Charmeaux is very elegant. So that's Charmeau, Charmeur. Haha, Char charm charming Charmeau, very good. Uh, uh, I was going to ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you that question, uh, Laurent. Pomar mm -hmm. has a reputation for being that more sort of muscular, tannic, and rustic style of Burgundy, but this is the proof that it's not necessarily the case? Sometimes they can be? No, it's, it's not necessarily the case. Uh, it's true that we said the Pomar is a masculine, uh, it's a wine for men, uh, for rugby men, but uh, it's not true. Uh, it's not true for the Premier Cru. In the Premier Cru, you have different wine, and uh, you have, for example, Les Charmeaux, uh, it's a Pomar, elegant Pomar. Elegant Pomar, and uh, it's not a rustic, very not rustic, and uh, it, it is is a particularity. What so, I like, I like, I like uh, Le Charbon uh, for uh, because this wine, uh, you have no surprise with this wine. You have, you have the both. You have the tannin of Pomar, and you have the elegance of Le Charbon. Sounds, sounds, sounds fantastic. Um, Winemaking, again, very similar to how the FISA? Winemaking is similar, uh, but uh, the difference, you have one difference is that I destined not in 100%. Uh, I keep 50% of the grape and uh, I put uh, in the vat uh, because uh, it's an uh, old wine and I can keep uh, the grape uh, it's interesting for the tannin of the grape, uh, and um, it's a principal difference. Uh, you have 25 days of uh, fermentation, and uh, you have more new oak in this wine. You have the double new oak, uh, that's the FISA. You have 40% of new oak uh, in this cuvee, in the Pomar Charmeau, and you have only 20% on the FISA. So it's a, the two differences. Destim and uh, the new oak, uh, forty percent. Uh, okay, yeah. so we we call that whole cluster fermentation. So for people watching, Laurent saying that uh, you know where the fixer he destemmed everything with this particular parcel. He's using half whole bunches and half destemmed. Uh, yeah. Does that make a big difference to the aromatics of the wine? I'm going to to tell you that. Uh, it's more open with a uh, very dark, dark fruit. Uh, cassis, uh, cassis. Black currant. Black, black currant. Yeah, but black we use cassis as currant. a tasting note. So. Uh, you have not the cherries. You have not cherries. Uh, you have cherries in the Fissa, but not in the Pomar Charmeau. It's uh, directly uh, black fruit. Black food. Now, a question we get quite often asked, Laurent, is how, as a winemaker, would you define the main differences between a village-level wine 
and the Premier Cru. So between, for example, a village Pomar and a village Premier Cru, what is it that makes the difference and, and how do they it differently? Uh, the principal difference uh, is, of course, the exposition. Um, generally, village, uh, it's, uh, uh, I'm going to take in French and you're going to translate. Les, les villages sont plutôt, euh, ne sont pas en pente, alors que les premiers crus sont en, en pente. Sont en pente. Okay. Ça, so, long, long. So Laurence, the topology, the topology of the vineyards is very different. That generally the villages are on lesser slopes or flatter land, and the premier crews tend to be on on steeper slopes, for one. And the second difference is uh, um, the the yeast is uh, in premier cru to about uh, thirty to thirty five hectoliter per hectare. Uh, when you vinify village, you can make. Uh, So you, you can almost make one and a half times more wine in the village level than you can in the Premier Cru. And yeah. limit those yields gives it so much more yeah. concentration and complexity. For yeah, sure. you have exception, for example, with the FISA, because it's a very, very old wine. And, uh, and, and so you make uh, 20 hectoliters per hectare. It's less than the Premier Cru. But it's an exception because... Uh, the edge, the middle of the edge of the vine in Bourgogne is 35 uh, years. It's not, uh, if he says the double. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Wonderful. So, uh, well, we've, we've, we've come to the end of our allotted time, I'm afraid. In fact, we've run over. Okay. So geez, apologies to anybody who's watching if we've, if, we've, if we've run over. But we could have listened to you all afternoon, Laurent. It was fascinating and very informative. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Just uh, one, one thing. Uh, it's perfect with a plate of cheese. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, the, second thing, the second thing is uh, à bientôt en Bourgogne. See you, see you soon. Thank you very birthday. much. Yep. Uh, just thank to finish very much. the price, the Pomar Premier Cru, uh, Les Charmes 2018, uh, average retail price is going to be around $110 a bottle. So... Bonsoir, good evening, and thank you again to Laurent. Thank you all for joining us. More very exciting Burgundy to come this week. We'll be joined later this week by the fabulous duo of Grégory Patria and Laure Guillotot from Jean-Claude Boisset, and then the inimitable um, Sylvie Poyot from Domaine de la Vougerie. So all that's going to be very exciting, and no doubt we'll learn lots more about Burgundy. So thanks for joining us. Take care, stay safe, be well. Laurent, au revoir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, Thank you, au revoir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, les États-Unis. Bye-bye. <laughs>